Hello, welcome to this Osmed presentation. My name is Dr. Gillian Ray Barul, and I'm a nurse researcher with the Avatar Group at Griffith University. Avatar stands for Alliance for Vascular Access Teaching and Research, and I've been with Avatar for about 10 years. Prior to this, I was an intensive care nurse, so my research has focused on teaching nurses how to assess and provide the best evidence-based care for patients. Today I'll be speaking about peripheral intravenous catheters, best practice guidelines and update. Our mission at Avatar is to make vascular access complications history. So peripheral intravenous catheters, as you know, a small flexible tube inserted into the, through the skin into a small vein in the arm, hand or foot. So also called a peripheral venous catheter, cannula, an IV or a drip, and PIVCs are inserted to allow medications, fluids, blood products, or contrast media to be given directly into the patient's bloodstream. So in the ideal world, we'd see dressings that were nice and clean, dry and intact. The site would be fine, no problems, no complications, etc. But in the real world, this is what we actually see. These are photographs that I've taken of patients' dressings and it's pretty poor as you can see. So that's why I'm really committed to changing practice here. So why do PIVCs matter? Well, they're the most common invasive device and over 70% of hospital patients worldwide will need at least one. Did you know that up to two thirds of PIVCs will fail before the patient completes their treatment? And that means that the patient will need another IV inserted to complete their treatment, or they may have further complications down the track. Down the track. For example, failed insertion increases the risk of future catheter failures, and repeated failed catheters lead to venous depletion and the need for more invasive and costly devices, such as central lines. The prevalence of PIVC complications is terrible. One in six patients will get phlebitis. Over one in 10 will have an infiltration. Some will have occlusion. Many patients get pain. IVs leak, they dislodge. And very rarely we see local infections and bloodstream infections. And while these may be more rare, they're far more serious. There are three types of phlebitis mechanical, chemical, and infective. Now, mechanical phlebitis is caused when the PIVC is too large for the vein or it's not properly secured, enabling it to wiggle around in the vein. This causes friction on the internal lining of the vein and leads to inflammation. It can also cause thrombosis. Chemical phlebitis is when the IV medication or fluid that you're infusing irritates the vein, causing inflammation. And this can be things like potassium or antibiotics. Infective phlebitis is when there's actually microorganism colonization of the PIVC and that causes a local infection. So the consequences of all these complications, well, it's very frustrating for the staff and the patient. For the staff, it means that they have to reinsert the IVs, which, you know, we're busy people. It takes time. It can mean that the patient will have to miss their medication or they'll get it late. It can mean that the patient has to actually stay in hospital longer. Some patients end up with terrible venous depletion. Some patients develop a needle phobia from being poked so many times. And of course, it's distressing having your family in hospital and they can't get their medication because they can't get a working IV. That's terrible. And of course, the worst complication of all is bloodstream infection. Now we know that five in a thousand patients will get a bloodstream infection from their central line or their pig. Did you know that one in two and a half thousand will get a bloodstream infection from their cannula? These are preventable infections, but they can lead to morbidity. Patient may need to go to intensive care, sepsis, cost. Each bloodstream infection costs 
the hospital about between 30,000 to 70,000 Australian dollars. And up to one in four or one in six patients will actually die from the bloodstream infection. So this is really serious stuff. In fact, it's so serious that in the United States, the ECRI Institute have now recognised PIVC-associated infection as a top 10 patient safety concern. Now, we used to think that PIVCs, they're just so small, they're such a benign device, but that's led to under-reporting, under-recognising and ignoring problems that have actually led to severe complications. So we need increased awareness of PIVC-related infection. We need routine active surveillance and follow-up reporting to reduce the risk. If we think about how a patient gets a bloodstream infection, there are four main pathways. The first is skin organisms. So we all have organisms on our skin, but before a cannula gets inserted, it's important to clean the skin properly because the patient has endogenous organisms on their skin. We also, as healthcare workers, have organisms on our hands, hence hand hygiene is so important. The next pathway is the contaminated catheter hub. So these are the needleless connectors, etc., that can be contaminated with the patient's own microorganisms or again by our healthcare worker hands. The third main pathway is contaminated infusates. So this is rarely from the actual um, pharmacy uh, manufacturer, etc., but it can we can contaminate medications or fluids while we're connecting up lines. And finally, hematogenous seeding from other infections in the body. Can, the bacteria can travel, catch onto the um, cannula and then seed and um, cause a bloodstream infection. So there's a lot that we need to be thinking about here. The last few years, we've really realised the importance of vessel health and preservation and Veins are not a limited, unlimited resource, so we need to be taking better care of the IVs that we have. Vessel health and preservation begins with site assessment and device selection. Site assessment is about thinking before we put an IV in, what sort of treatment are we planning to infuse? How long is the treatment going to be for? Does the patient have suitable veins? Do they have any other anatomical considerations that we need to be thinking about, such as an AV fistula or lymph node resection? What sort of catheter are you putting in? How long is it? What size are you choosing? The inserter's skills and competency are also important. We know that if you're not, um, not everyone is a great cannulator. So if you're not a great cannulator and you think the patient's got difficult veins, then get somebody with ultrasound. Don't just have a poke first and then give up. If the patient needs IV therapy more than five days, they don't need a peripheral IV, they need a central line. So consider peripherally inserted central catheter or midline catheter. And then finally, patient history and preference is critical. We did some surveys and we asked patients about what their experience with PIVCs were. And they said that the staff never asked them about their history, even if they were a difficult stick. And when they reported that they were a difficult stick, the staff didn't listen to them. They said, we'll have a go anyway. No, we don't do that anymore. There's a lot of reasons for people to have difficult intravenous access. Contributing factors can include things like diseases or conditions that affect the integrity of the vessels, such as diabetes, a known history of poor venous accessibility. If the patient tells you they've had more than two attempts in the past to have an IV successfully inserted, then stop and think, are you really skilled enough to be able to get this one in? Patients who are excessively hairy can be difficult to um, cannulate. And it's important that you clip up the hair and don't shave it because that can increase the risk of bloodstream infection. Particular skin types in particular populations, such as neonates or the elderly with um, fragile skin. 
People with a lot of keloid scarring or tattoos can be difficult to cannulate. The age of the patient is also something to consider. Again, neonates or elderly can be quite difficult to cannulate. Young toddlers with their chubby arms can be difficult to cannulate. Patients who are obese or malnourished. Patients who are obese are a special category because sometimes the veins are quite deep and you may need a longer cannula to access the vein. It's important to have a certain amount of vein of catheter in the vein. So if the veins are quite deep, you need a longer catheter. Patients who are dehydrated can be challenging because their veins may be a bit collapsed. And history of treatment with anticoagulants or corticosteroids, history of intravenous drug use. These are all the things that you need to be thinking about before you start poking around in people's veins. The next quadrant is vascular access device insertion. So I'm asking you today, before you insert a PIVC, stop and think. Does the patient really need this line? Every time the skin is broken, the patient's at risk. This is quite interesting. The credit study was done in an emergency department in Australia. And this was a study done based on the research that up to 50% of emergency department inserted IVs are inserted to take blood and never used again. So every device is an infection risk. We shouldn't be just sticking things in to take blood. So before in this study, what they did is they asked the staff to just be aware, are you 80% sure this patient will need this PIVC for the, in the next 24 hours? And if you're not sure, then wait. Think before you stick. We don't want any just in case PIVCs. From this study, they reduced their insertion rate from 42% to 32%. And they increased the amount of IVs that were actually needed by 13%. So they made a big difference just by asking people to stop and think. And if you're sure the patient needs an IV, go ahead. But if you're not sure, just wait. So best practice for insertion. Well, unfortunately, not everybody is going to have a successful insertion first time round. In fact, most people will need two or three goes to get a good functioning IV that's going to last the distance. There are ways that we can improve this practice. Obviously, hand hygiene. Keeping in mind that bloodstream infection is a critical complication, wash your hands. Offer the patient skin anesthesia. So this could be spray or lignocaine or something like that. Use a, use a dressing pack or insertion kit. Use chlorhexidine to scrub the skin and allow it to dry before carrying on. The best spot, evidence shows us the best spot for an IV is a 20 gauge in the forearm. It'll last the distance. It's important to avoid areas of flexion. Don't go straight for the anticubital fossa. It's not appropriate for long-term use and it's more associated with complications such as phlebitis and infection. It's also uncomfortable for the patient to have an IV in their elbow. Flush the line and document. We did a study of global PIVCs and found that 20% globally were never documented, never made it to the patient record. It's not good enough, so make sure you document. You should document the date, the time, the size of the catheter, the site of it, who put it in, and why was it put in. So the next quadrant is about VAD maintenance because that insertion is only 10% of the patient's IV journey. Keeping it in, looking after it is the next 90%. So we need best practice guidelines at the point of care. Too many times the guidelines are too long, nurses haven't read them, so I simplified them into a simple mnemonic called I Decided. And I'll step you through that. I stands for identify if the patient has a device. That sounds simple, but we know that many patients have actually gone home with a peripheral cannula in situ 
because nobody realised it was there, no one remembered to take it out. Don't rely on the documentation. Have a look at the patient's arms and ask the patient if they have a line in. D stands for does the patient need this device? We know that up to 25% of IVs are left in when they're not needed. That puts the patient at an unacceptable risk of bloodstream infection. So uh, every day, every patient, every device, does the patient need it? E stands for effective function. And this is making sure that your cannula aspirates blood and flushes before you insert anything into it. Just make sure it works. If it isn't working, it doesn't need to be there, right? C stands for complication free. So this is just a reminder. You need to be looking for pain, redness, swelling, etc. Any complications, take the line out. I is a reminder for infection prevention. Hand hygiene, scrubbing the needless connectors for at least five seconds with chlorhexidine or alcohol swabs and allowing them to dry before accessing. D stands for dressing and securement. We know the dressing should be clean, dry and intact. If they're not, then you need to take the dressing down, clean the area and reapply dressing. Don't just tape over the top. It, um, you, need, you need to secure your lines carefully so the patient doesn't accidentally dislodge them. And E stands for evaluate and educate. So ask the patient, do you know why you have this IV? And if they don't, then you tell them. You remind them to look out for things like pain and redness and swelling and to contact you with any questions. And D stands for document. Document your decision. I decided, based on this assessment, to continue, troubleshoot or remove the cannula. And document everything you do to that cannula and how the patient tolerates it. The bottom line is, if it's not needed, not working, or not tolerated, what is it doing there? Remove it. Which brings me to the fourth quadrant, VAD removal. Did you know that a patient can actually get phlebitis up to 48 hours after a cannula comes out? So it's important when you take it out to tell the patient, keep an eye on that site. If you've got any questions or any concerns about it, let us know. And that includes if the catheter comes out on the day of discharge, Tell them, keep an eye on that over the next couple of days. And if you've got any problems at all, contact your GP. So I've given you a lot of evidence. Well, how do you actually get that into practice in your workplace? Well, you begin by defining your goals. You have to know what you're aiming for. So for example, my goal may be all ED frontline staff will be trained and competent in the use of ultrasound for PIVC insertion. Or I might say, we're not going to have any catheter-associated bloodstream infections this year. Well, I've got my goal. How do I get there? It's about providing resources. It's about providing the guidelines at the bedside for all staff and providing education for the guidelines. Providing education when the evidence updates, like the five-second scrub for the needless connectors, you tell your staff, it's changed. It's important that they know that. Provide ultrasound machines and training, especially in areas with high incidence of cannulation, such as ED. It's important that we have clinical facilitators and nurse educator support available for bedside staff. There's no point in having those staff who continually get pulled to look after the patients. They're there to provide education support to the staff. And you need a management that values staff education that provides resources for learning, time for learning, and staff to help you learn. It's important to measure, benchmark, and feedback. So you undertake regular clinical audits of your PIVCs. Sure, it's important. Have a look at what's actually going on in your ward. You don't need to audit the whole hospital on one day. That's silly. Audit your ward, 10 cannulas a month. See what's going on and then benchmark your findings with the literature, other hospitals and the national standards, etc. 
Tell your staff what the results of the audit were as soon as possible. Don't wait a month and then tell them, oh, back last month we had a bloodstream infection. Not good enough. Tell them when it happens. And seek staff input on how they want to see things improve in their ward. You implement the improvements and you re-audit. And of course, you celebrate your success. If you don't have any bloodstream infections or phlebitis, good on you. Keep it up. The Australian Commission of Safety and Quality in Healthcare in May 2021 put out this Management of Peripheral Intravenous Catheters Clinical Care Standard. This is freely available on the Australian Commission website. I encourage you, actually, I insist you go and have a look at it. It comes with 10 quality statements, and these quality statements support the national standards, particularly Standard 2 on partnering with consumers and Standard 3, infection prevention. The 10 quality statements are everything I've talked about today, assessing the intravascular access needs, informing and partnering with patients, making sure you've got competent staff putting in lines, making sure you're choosing the right site, which is the forearm, and choosing the right device. Maximise your first insertion success by asking the patient about their previous history and getting somebody with ultrasound if you don't think it's going to be easy. Insert using the techniques that I discussed before, making sure that the line is inserted properly, it's the dressing is clean, dry and intact, and everything is secure. And of course, documenting. Document what you've done, document any problems. Every shift, at least, you should be looking at the lines, assessing, checking the patency, and reviewing the ongoing need. Every single day, every patient, every device, is it needed? Is it working? Any problems, can it come out? You remove your line safely and you replace them if needed as per your hospital policy. And that's all I wanted to say today. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions whatsoever about vascular access, please get in touch with somebody from the avatargroup.org.au. And thank you to Osmed.